right, everybody. We're down to the last panel, and you all are the die-hard folks. This is great. Um, your dedication is wonderful. Um, so this is, as we've gone through the sequence of issues, this is, all right, we have taxpayer rights. How do we make them function in the tax administration? And to do this is Jay Rosengard from the Kennedy School of Government, and I'm just going to hand it over to him. And at the end, I'm going to make a few administrative announcements dealing with tomorrow and stuff like that, so stay tuned. Thank you, Nina. I'm, I'm honored by the invitation to moderate the final panel of the inaugural International Conference on Taxpayer Rights. And before we begin, I'd like to make two comments, one regarding the conference in general and the other about this panel in particular, and then we'll turn it over to the panelists. So first, I'd like to congratulate the U.S. National Taxpayer Advocate, um, who's kind of the mastermind of this conference. Um, not only did she dream up this wonderful initiative with some co-conspirators in the audience, so sharing the credit, but she clearly has poured her intellect, body, and soul into making her dream a reality. And it's especially heartening because the theme of the conference acknowledges that with taxing authority comes tax authority responsibility, and that with taxpayer responsibility comes taxpayer rights. And the power to tax, speaking now as an economist, is a necessary authority granted to the state so it can generate the resources necessary to finance the provision of essential public infrastructure and services. But such a powerful authority is susceptible to intentional misuse and unintentional abuse. And the responsibility to pay taxes is, to paraphrase former US Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and engraved over the entrance of the headquarters of the IRS, the responsibility to pay taxes is the price we pay for a civilized society. But this social contract, like all contracts, flows in two directions and thus requires taxpayer protection. So I'm thrilled that Nina has convened this conference to facilitate a thoughtful, in-depth, global exploration of the role of taxpayer rights in ensuring that a tax regime is a just regime. Second, I'm delighted that we are concluding the conference with an examination of the challenges in operationalizing taxpayer rights. I believe that most tax policy is actually made in the course of tax administration, and that taxpayer rights policy is no exception. And in fact, I run an executive education program at the Harvard Kennedy School called Comparative Tax Policy and Administration, or COMTAX for short, which focuses extensively on the interaction between design and implementation. Um, if you want to learn more about it, um, go to the Kennedy School website, ask Tonya, who's one of our graduates, ask Ali from the previous panel. Uh, we take credit for all the accomplishments of all of our wonderful graduates and none of the blame for their failures. Uh, and of course, you can ask Nina, who has taught, I believe, uh, in every program since we launched Comtax in 2008. So a um, lot of people here, a lot of uh, familiarity with our program. But the, the, the essence of this panel is no matter how brilliant the concept of taxpayer rights, and no matter how eloquent the legislation on taxpayer rights, without careful attention to the effective execution of taxpayer rights policy, these noble intentions will not be realized. For example, how do we raise taxpayer awareness of their rights so they hold the tax authority accountable? How do we train and incentivize tax officials so they are capable and motivated to protect taxpayer rights. And what a splendid panel we have to facilitate our discussion on operationalizing taxpayer rights. Not only do we have three internationally respected lawyers, uh, but all three panelists are also practitioners who work professionally in the public interest. Amanda, as attorney, advisor to the National Taxpayer Advocate in the United States, Eric, as CEO of the Office of the Tax Ombud in South Africa, 
And Tony has a legal counsel at the regulatory authority, in this case for energy, but also has worked in tax in Greece. And I guess to promote diversity and through aggressive affirmative action, I am the token economist on the panel. Okay. <laughs> so without further ado, um, turn over to the panelists and they'll speak in the order they are seated. Thank you, and thank you, Nina, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to divide my remarks into, I guess, two parts today. Uh, first of all, talking about the taxpayer side of things, and then the second half of my presentation is going to talk about uh, agency employees, and both are going to focus on creating awareness and um, educating them. So just as a, a little bit of background, a 2012 survey that was conducted for the Taxpayer Advocate Service found that fewer than half of U.S. taxpayers believe that they have rights before the IRS, and only 11% said um, they knew what they were. And so even though the Internal Revenue Code includes dozens of specific taxpayer rights, um, it doesn't contain any kind of uh, formal statement of the fundamental principles from which these uh, specific statutory rights derive. So even though the adoption of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights by the IRS in 2014 was a, a very positive step, um, it's only going to be as effective as uh, the agency makes it by incorporating it into its uh, daily operations and interactions with uh, taxpayers. So um, first, talking about creating awareness. Um, the Internal Revenue Code is nearly four million words long, and the specific statutory protections within it are scattered throughout. So it's certainly a challenge to um, actually inform taxpayers about all their rights. And so the, the idea here is even if taxpayers cannot know all of their specific rights that arise in specific circumstances, um, we can frame them by talking about the fundamental rights and then their knowledge of these fundamental rights will spur them to seek more information when they need it. And this is precisely what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights does. And um, I know Commissioner Koskinen yesterday spoke about uh, Publication 1, which um, incorporates the new Taxpayer Bill of Rights and a plain language description of each of the rights, which is, is really important because both um, we as the Taxpayer Advocate Service and taxpayers can actually cite that language from Publication 1 in advocating for taxpayers. And um, you'll see here on the screen, I kind of lopped it off. It does actually have 10 rights. Um, <laughs> we can count. But I, I wanted to make it a, a little bit bigger so you could uh, see what it looked like. And by statute, um, the IRS is required to provide a statement of taxpayer rights to taxpayers when it contacts them regarding either an examination or a collection. And um, Commissioner Koskinen yesterday um, said that it's printed, I believe, over 30 million copies each year. But um, even with this many copies given out, there's still some limitations to how effective this is to uh, create taxpayer awareness. Um, first of all, publication one isn't always given out. As you may know, there was a controversy in the United States in 2013 regarding the treatment of um, organizations applying for tax-exempt status. And a review of what occurred found that none of those organizations received publication one because they weren't undergoing an examination or collection, and so the IRS wasn't required to send it. Uh, also, a 2012 survey found that taxpayers really prefer a variety of channels to learn about their rights, so not just a paper publication included with their notices. And, and I think you heard yesterday about a number of different ways in which the IRS is using um, alternative forms of media to create awareness about taxpayer rights, but there are some limitations, and I, I think the IRS has put a, a lot of um, effort into updating its website, but um, it, unfortunately, taxpayers don't always enter the IRS website uh, through the home page, and so they're not always going to find that uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights page. The IRS.gov website currently has um, approximately 82,000 different pages on it. So even though there are almost 50 call-out boxes for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, you might not actually find it on the page that you're going to. And so therefore, for any agency that has as 
large of a website as we do, um, there really needs to be a communications plan that develops a methodology for identifying um, which website pages are most likely to be entrance points into irs.gov or the agency's uh, website and um, which pages are most crucial based upon both the rights that arise and the consequences for taxpayers if they don't uh, exercise those rights in reference to that issue or at that stage uh, in the process. Another challenge is reaching taxpayers before they have a problem with the IRS, which in many cases means before they file. And um, the Taxpayer Advocate Service worked with the IRS um, last year to update the instructions to the individual income tax return series to include information about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Still, um, there are very few taxpayers in the United States who um, actually do their own taxes on paper and use the instructions. Um, a 2012 survey found that 42% of taxpayers now use a paid preparer and um, many others, I don't think we had numbers on this, use software to prepare their returns. And so there are some real opportunities here for taxpayers who don't actually have any direct interaction with a tax agency to communicate taxpayer rights information by either um, incorporating standard language into the software or um, working with the preparers. And in the United States, we only have a voluntary continuing education program for preparers, but this would be an opportunity to teach them about taxpayer rights. Also, um, preparers are required to apply for a, an identification number, and so we could incorporate taxpayer rights information into that application so that they then have resources to share with their taxpayers who come back to them with problems later. Um, once uh, taxpayers understand a set of fundamental principles, the challenge then is how to tie these principles to the statutory provisions so that taxpayers can learn the specific rules. And um, there was a question yesterday um, during one of the panels, you know, is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights enforceable? Because, you know, in the United States, it's a statement of principles that's been adopted administratively, and it does not have the force of law um, yet, as Nina Olson would say. And so this is why it's really important to look to the statutory provisions, uh, some of which do have um, enforceable remedies. And so as an example, taxpayers may know they have the right to quality service, um, but they may not know that the code prohibits the IRS from contacting taxpayers about collection either before 8 a.m. or um, after 9 p.m. And so uh, the Taxpayer Advocate Service created this crosswalk to help taxpayers use the fundamental rights as a starting point and then guide them uh, to the specific statutory protections. And we also included links to um, relevant publications as well as some other resources such as the uh, U.S. Tax Court's website, which I think as you heard yesterday is a, a wonderful resource for taxpayers. Um, the third piece of the, the taxpayer side of things is facilitating taxpayers in exercising their rights. Um, in many situations, a prerequisite for exercising one's rights is just being able to um, reach the tax agency. And I, I think we heard a lot about um, customer service earlier today. Um, but just to give you a couple numbers, in fiscal year uh, 2015, the uh, toll-free assistance lines, um, taxpayers calling these lines only reached an employee 38.1% uh, of the time. And this was after waiting on hold for um, over 30 minutes. And in, in, in this particular uh, instance, I think the responsibility is not only on the IRS, but, it, but it's also on Congress because they need to fund the agency such that they have the people there to answer the phones and to um, answer the written correspondence sent by taxpayers. But I'm not totally letting the IRS off. There are um, some other things the IRS can be doing. Um, beyond just reaching a person at the IRS, it's important to be able to reach the right person. And so, um, as an example, if a taxpayer wants to exercise their right to quality service and speak to a supervisor about inadequate service, um, they need to find a way to reach that supervisor. And if a taxpayer needs to ask questions about documentation during an examination, um, which is part of the taxpayer's right to challenge and be heard, they need to be able to speak with an employee who is actually knowledgeable about their case. Um, another necessity for taxpayers is having the information they need to make informed decisions about whether or not to exercise their rights. 
Um, and an example here involves um, refund disallowances. Um, the code requires the IRS, when it disallows a refund, to provide the specific reasons as to why it's disallowed. Um, but when we've reviewed um, some of these notices, we found that the, the notices don't really explain the exact reason, nor do they provide the taxpayer with sufficient information to make a decision about whether to challenge. So some very basic information, such as the amount of the claim that was disallowed, is often not on these letters. And so taxpayers can't really make an informed decision about whether to exercise rights, such as you know, the right to an appeal or maybe even the right to retain representation. Also related to the right to be informed, uh, the IRS sometimes even asks taxpayers to waive their rights without explaining what they mean. And uh, going back to the situation of a refund being disallowed, um, the code requires um, the IRS to mail to the taxpayer what's called a notice of claim disallowance, which begins the time period in which the taxpayer can challenge the disallowance in court. But the IRS routinely asks taxpayers to waive the right to receive this notice. And the letter that it uses to a, an, accompany this um, waiver suggestion, if you will, I don't know if I can call it a suggestion, it doesn't even imply the taxpayer has a choice. It says if you agree with the adjustment, sign this form. And so the taxpayer has no idea what rights they're giving up. And so uh, a couple of solutions to some of these problems. Um, first, a tax agency can make a directory available to taxpayers that lists the um, different offices and leadership so that um, a taxpayer can actually reach out to a manager in the appropriate office. Um, another option is to institute a telephone system similar to what's called a 311 system where you call and speak to an operator who then transfers you to the specific uh, department or office who handles your issue. Um, and I know sometimes the IRS comes back and says, yes, you know, we already have one of these systems because if you happen to actually reach somebody when you call the IRS, they will transfer you somewhere. But um, more often than not, you're transferred to like a generic customer service representative and you're not actually transferred to somebody um, who has ex expertise in your issue. And there, there was a comment yesterday from a practitioner who was trying desperately to reach out to the IRS to talk to the program owner regarding an issue, and, and the IRS, it seemed, had actually walled off um, the person who would actually be empowered to make changes uh, from that practitioner. And so that I thought that was an excellent point. Also, um, to further the facilitation of taxpayer rights, a tax agency should conduct a thorough review of all correspondence that gives rise to specific taxpayer rights and create recommendations for additional information to include. Um, next, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. I'm gonna move to the employee side of things. Um, first talking about education. One challenge is even if employees are trained on taxpayer rights, they may lack an understanding of the entire tax process from the point of filing a return all the way through the tax controversy process. And so they may not understand um, how the actions they take affect later rights or what rights have already been provided to taxpayers earlier in the process. And an example is a collection employee may become so focused on collecting the liability that they may overlook other issues. For example, the taxpayer may believe that they don't actually owe the liability and the collection employee may not inform them about um, other options such as um, an offering compromise based on doubt as to liability or the administrative process of uh, audit reconsideration. So the challenge is to provide all employees with a basic understanding of the entire process and the rights that arise. And the Taxpayer Advocate Service has uh, developed some training to accomplish this. Um, it was a three-part training called the Roadmap to a Tax Ad Administration. Tax, I think that's it. Um, and the first stage of this training provides a high-level overview of um, the legal issues related to the entire process. So we have return filing, examination, appeals, uh, collection, and judicial review. And so the employee got to understand how the particular stage at which they came into contact with the taxpayer affected rights before and after. Um, another challenge is employees are likely to find themselves out of the practice of um, viewing their tasks through the framework of fundamental rights. And so I'd like to give an example of a positive thing the IRS did in 2015 during the filing season. It developed a series of weekly fact sheets 
to remind employees how their daily tasks um, supported the fundamental rights. And um, finally, another important thing when it comes to educating employees is incorporating the taxpayer rights information into the technical training as opposed to separating them out. I think standalone training is effective, but as tax laws and procedures change over time, employees need to know how these affect uh, taxpayer rights. Uh, finally, I want to spend some time on incorporating taxpayer rights into employee guidance. Um, in the United States, we have the very lengthy and complex Internal Revenue Manual, um, which provides most of our guidance to employees. And even where the IRM instructions direct employees to take certain actions to protect taxpayer rights, um, it doesn't always explain why the employee should take that action or how it relates to taxpayer rights, which leads to employees uh, neglecting to take actions or cutting corners. And an example involves a new IRM section um, this was a result of a, a um, U.S. tax court case in 2009, Vinicieri v. Commissioner, and um, this case held that if during a collection due process hearing, a taxpayer establishes um, that the levy will cause economic hardship, the IRS cannot issue the levy even if the taxpayer has past due unfiled returns. So after this decision, the IRS proposed a new IRM section that they actually hadn't had before on pre-levy considerations, and it had a list of bullet points for factors that employees should consider before they, um, before they, you know, propose a levy. And unfortunately, the prohibition against levying in the case of economic hardship, first of all, it wasn't really listed as a prohibition, and secondly, it was just buried within one of the bullet points of um, factors to merely consider. So the Taxpayer Advocate Service worked with the IRS to revise this IRM to clearly state that if the revenue officer can verify that the levy will cause an economic hardship, it will not be issued. And then it goes further and it provides a reason. It says, because if there is economic hardship, the levy must be released. And then it provides the code section that requires the uh, levy's release. And um, this revised provision is really effective because it provides the reason why, and it, it tells the employees that actually under the law, they would have to release it. And I, I, so I think it's a lot harder for an employee to ignore that provision. Um, another another um, positive that came out of revising this IRM section is um, it really presents a solution to the problem of employees taking a narrow interpretation of the IRM, which is a, a huge problem in the United States. If an IRM has a set of factors and there's an item that's not listed, an employee might refuse to consider it even if the list isn't intended to be all inclusive. So turning back to the pre-levy example, you could have a taxpayer who maybe was not responsive to collection because they were undergoing a medical treatment and couldn't provide their financial information, but this isn't listed in the bullet points. So how do you get a collection employee to consider that and make the right decision um, even where the situation isn't covered? And this is where using the fundamental principles of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights really um, comes in handy. So what uh, the Taxpayer Advocate Service did is we put a description of the right to a fair and just tax system right up front in that IRM section. And it says, uh, taxpayers can expect the IRS to consider the underlying facts and circumstances regarding a taxpayer's ability to provide information timely. So in this case, the employee reading that along with the IRM may come to the conclusion that even though the taxpayer was not responsive to collection, it would be unfair not to consider their medical condition um, in deciding whether or not to levy. Um, a final barrier, I'll try to cover this uh, quickly, is this is a, particularly a problem in, in the United States and any other very mature tax system is the, the length the sheer size of the IRM, it leads to um, situations being covered in different places and multiple sections, and it's often, they're often covered inconsistently, or um, sometimes sections even contradict each other. And there are a couple examples I provide in the paper about um, sections asking a taxpayer to waive their collection due process rights. And one IRM section just clearly says to the employee, you should solicit the waiver, period, that's it. And then there's another IRM section in a different part that says um, you should explain to the taxpayer what rights they're giving up by forgoing the, the collection due process hearing and reinforce that the decision is um, up to the taxpayer. 
So very quickly, two, uh, two solutions to these problems. One is to advise IRM authors to identify parallel sections when they're um, revising the IRM so that they can either request those be changed or flag them for later. Another approach is to develop a methodology for identifying high impact sections. And this is something Taz um, has done um, to identify those sections that are most crucial to update now and hope that you know that the other sections will be revised later. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nina, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, from all the way from South Africa, and I'm sure you can pick up with a very good uh, South African accent. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, it's actually a privilege to be able to speak in an environment like this. Uh, the, the experiences that we share, uh, I, I think, are very, very incredible. And uh, if we can just uh, learn from this, and put certain things into practice in our various jurisdictions, I think it will be great. Now, mine is simply just to speak about the challenges in operationalizing uh, the taxpayer rights, and uh, specifically looking at the uh, South African situation, just where we come from uh, as a country. Now, the definitely coming out of the apartheid days, uh, back in 1994, in other words, Obviously, serious challenges at that, at, that, at that stage. I mean, if I can cite a few examples, um, the tax rate uh, was probably the highest, um, with 48% uh, you know, of your income going into tax. And the tax morale was very low. And uh, you know, for obvious reasons, people believe that you know, they will not fund a system that is oppressive. Uh, they will rather fund a system that is not oppressive. And so the tax morale was very uh, low, and the tax register out of over 40 million people, it was in the order of uh, just about below three million. Uh, so I mean, you can imagine, you know, that the tax rate was too high because of the tax, you know, just a small pool, you know, a small, you know, small section of the community that was paying tax at that stage. So taking over a government like that. And you also with a very high deficit, um, budget deficit. You know, you obviously have a lot of work to do, and it, as a result of that, you know, the uh, government that came into being, the democratic government, they decided to have a tax uh, reform. And imagine you changing somebody that never used to pay tax and rebelling, and you want to tell them, you know, overnight from now on you pay tax. So <laughs> you can imagine, you know, uh, and also and trying to balance, uh, you want to bring the tax rate down so that you can invite investment. You want to also make sure people are paying the right amount of tax. So those were some of the tricky challenges. So I'm saying this so that, you know, can understand where we come from because we recently established the Office of the Tax Ombud. Um, uh, only probably yeah, about two years uh, ago. It was officially launched last year. So you can understand the background and the challenges that we're still facing. But having had that CATS commission, I mean, a, a commission appointed, there was a commission uh, appointed in order to look at the tax reform. Uh, it was headed by a, a, a very good attorney, uh, CATS. Uh, his name is CATS, so it was called the CATS commission. So that it, it had to come up with various suggestions on how to improve. Uh, uh, one of those, for example, you know, some of the um, discriminatory laws that we had uh, prior to 1994. You know, you would have uh, separate tax rates uh, being applied uh, according to your gender or your um, whether you're married or not married. <laughs> Uh, so, so you had those kind of uh, very difficult laws, a and as a result, there was, it was necessary to, to eliminate those and, and introduce a unitary uh, um, uh, tax rate. So that 
uh, commission produced the first re report to say that you know uh, the the tax system is subject to the constitution, so you can't have discriminatory laws, and and it must be con it must conform also to the rule of law, and then the commission also uh, concluded obviously that you know eliminate all this uh, 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 this uh, uh, different tax rates and. And one of the other practices that you could have then was that uh, the commissioner could just issue an assessment and would not be required to give you reasons. So you would not even request reasons. So, I mean, that's how unconstitutional certain things were happening. So as a result of that, you know, so such laws had to be changed and the commissioner was instructed that you will give reasons for your assessments. Uh, and uh, so the commissioner decided, yes, I'm going to give reasons for any assessment that I produce. And also, there were certain documents that you never have access to uh, in terms of you know, you, how they determine your taxes, how they assess, and you know, uh, they will have the handbooks which, and the secular minutes that, you know, that they will distribute amongst the officials uh, on how to to deal with a certain tax issue, but that was not available to the public. Now, the, commi um, the commission pr uh, proposed that that be made available. So, from, so at, some uh, at some stage on, uh, the commissioner had to make provision uh, uh, or give that information. That information was uh, available to the public. Mm -hmm. Now, linked to that was also the introduction of the, uh, the tax ombud. But I'm talking about the mid-90s. So that's when the proposal was made by this commission that you must have a tax ombud to protect the taxpayer rights and also to mediate between taxpayers and, uh, and, uh, and revenue. Now, I'll pack the issue slightly and then uh, go on to the next issue, which was also recommended around that stage that there must be a statement of taxpayer rights. Uh, this was to be contained in the statute, no, not to be contained in the st statute, rather the rights to constitute a contract between revenue authority and taxpayers, which could be used by taxpayers as a means of evaluating uh, service levels and administrative action encountered in their dealings with the, the commissioner. So we're talking back in the mid-90s. Uh, uh, this is what was happening. Yes, uh, and this obviously was in line with the o OECD comments that, uh, um, which I can just simply quote, that uh, many countries are serving, are seeking to improve service provided to the taxpayer in part because modern tax systems require increased cooperation from the taxpayers if they are to cooperate efficiently and also as a result of changing attitudes was the role of the tax administration vis-a-vis -vis the taxpayer. This cooperation is more likely to be forthcoming if there's mutual trust between the taxpayer and the administration, and if the taxpayer rights are clearly set out and protected. Now, coming with that obviously means there must be a service charter, uh, taxpayer rights. Um, now, uh, um, uh, as a and following that uh, um, proposal, there was the revenue authority, but it took a couple of years to come up with the service charter, which was introduced in 2005. Um, and it had to list a number of issues. But I must pause to mention that at the time, the, the taxpayer rights was, you know, some parliamentarians thought, no, you can't just give rights, there must be taxpayer rights with obligations. <laughs> so, so you have that kind of challenge, you know, even now as we speak, we do not have proper taxpayer rights. Now, the people always mention it's not just rights, but there must be obligations. So that's one of the challenges, you know, the attitude, the, you know, that um, y you're dealing with from time to time. Now, in the charter, which I mean, in the, in the interest of time, I may not have, I may not read all of it, but uh, it, it, it had to, it had, it said, look, to help you, 
you are entitled to expect SARS, the Revenue Authority, to, to help you through self-explanatory leaflets, booklets, as well as our website. Courteous and professional service at all times, providing clear and accurate and helpful responses. Uh, making clear uh, uh, what action you need to take, uh, by when, and it, it went all the way. And, uh, but then it says in the end, in return, your obligations are to be honest, submit full and accurate information on time, uh, pay your tax and dues in time and in full, encourage others to pay their tax. <laughs> so now it becomes an obligation on you to make sure that your neighbor is paying tax and, and, all, you know, and they are Jews, but I know that it has been mentioned a number of times in here. Um, so you had that preoccupation about obligations, not just rights. So that's one of the, those challenges. Now, the other issue as well was uh, the fact that the Office of the Tax Ombud had to be uh, um, established. That one took much longer. Um, it, uh, our office was only established uh, two years ago, in 2013, following the passing of a Tax Administration Act, uh, which was done in 2011. Now, we have a challenge. We don't have the taxpayer rights. Now, when we raised it with uh, revenue, for example, uh, uh, we were told that um, you, <coughs> I think you know the, 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 the rights are there in the act. Now, how many of us read the entire act in order to pick up your rights, <laughs> uh, to understand what your rights are? And you know, so, so it was sort of a guide for us anyway. We, so we went, we said, we're not going to wait uh, for revenue to come up with this right. So we are going to go into the act ourselves and list all the rights that are mentioned <laughs> in the act. Guess how many they were? 138 rights. <laughs> so we thought, this is a good idea. Uh, so based on that, these are the rights, but we had to summarize them uh, in the way that anybody can use them. So if you go to any hospital, we mentioned this, if you go to any hospital, you have the patient's rights, they are listed carefully, and you will know exactly who to complain to if you are not happy. So that was one of those, those, those issues. We said, if hospitals can do that, why can't you do it? If you go to revenue, you will not even have a complaints management system. You will never understand how to complain. So you, you can't. This is one of the challenges. Now, anyway, we, 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 we have drafted now. We have condensed them into probably 10, 11, almost similar to, to yours, Nina. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the ex exercise, that's exactly what we almost picked up. Now, we have summarized that uh, you know, so that we take the initiative. We're going to share that with SARS, uh, with the Revenue Authority. We are going to say, these are the rights. Uh, in, within the next week or so, uh, we are going to provide them with that and, and, and uh, leave it to, with them to, to digest a bit, but we we'll expect them to, um, uh, to come back to us. Our mandate is, you know, similar to look at the service-related issues. Um, but those service-related issues, people must know exactly what level of service uh, they can expect from revenue. If I write a letter to revenue, if I write, send an email to, 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 to revenue, uh, how long must I wait uh, to, 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 to deal with it uh, for a response? Uh, if if, if I, I lodge an objection and I dispute an assessment, how long does it take? Uh, the level of service. So that has not been spelled out. Uh, that, that one that they had, which was introduced back in 2005, has subsequently been withdrawn uh, from the website. So uh, taxpayers are left, to, to, um, are left in the dark in terms of the kind of service they may expect from uh, revenue. So that's not desirable. So we said to them, look, you need to get the service standards up and running. Uh, when can we have that? We need to have that. And especially that even years before they were warned for the proper establishment of the Office of the Tax Ombuds, you will need to have these things in order, right from the, uh, from the, from the scratch. But anyway, that has not happened, so we're busy working with that. 
They gave us a draft, we went back to them, we gave some, some inputs, and we said, this is what we think you must do. So it's with them, within the next month or so, a service standards will be given. But some of the things that were in the draft were that if you fall initially, or if you phone us, 60% uh, of the calls that are coming, uh, we will, it will answer within three rings. So how do you measure whether you are part of the 60% or part of the 40%? <laughs> how do you know? So we you said, no, you can't have anything like that. Let's just have a proper, proper, proper um, a, a measure. Now, the issue of the, this taxpayer rights, the question was, who has to draft that? That was one of the challenges. Now, I'm not sure Nina, and I had to ask Nina off the record, you know, who, did you draft the uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights or was it uh, revenue? Now, uh, I won't give you an answer, but <laughs> I'll leave. You can ask Nina. So <laughs> we, 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 we thought we, we will have to do it ourselves because uh, we, if we do not initiate that process, it may never take, take off. So that's one of the challenges. It's a culture shock. Uh, because all these things have to happen now almost at once. Uh, prior to that, there was no oversight uh, over you know, the revenue authority, but now there's, there's oversight, it's an issue. Um, so it, it, we're not used to, to that kind of environment. Now you have, uh, we have uh, officials to deal with. Um, you know, the commissioner is very much committed in, in a lot of ways to making sure that uh, the office of the tax ombud operates as, uh, efficiently and no difficulties. We have a good relationship. But the challenge sometimes, you find that people right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we communicate that message to the last person, even the person who's actually answering the phone um, uh, at a contact center? Now, that is a message, that's a challenge that we have, communicating to the employees to make sure that they understand what the uh, rights taxpayers have. Now, even to the point of complaining and knowing where to complain, now you cannot introduce a system, for example, and say this is going to be the complaints management system, but, I would ex but I'm not gonna tell anybody about it. But I would expect people to know it and to know that they cannot go to the tax ombud unless they've exhausted this complaints management system. So those are some of the challenges. You have a soft, soft launch of a system, but you don't tell taxpayers uh, about that. Now, the taxpayers, they come and go, uh, and they simply, they, they, they communicate with one person, they say, no, I've now lodged a complaint with the tax ombud, and that, then the taxpayer feels pressurized to withdraw the complaint because certain um, people are now uh, um, uh, cutting short on their rights or, or infringing on their rights. If, if they are being audited, for example, you will be entitled, when they, they write a letter to you, you'll be entitled to respond uh, within 21 days. So not more than 21 days. But sometimes you are coerced, you are forced, no, you must respond now, you know, and then they say, well, you know, they consented to responding within five working days. And that five working days, you are unable to provide the information. You have a disallowance of an objection or, or, or yes, and, and you end up in a paying environment. Now, two minutes to go. <laughs> so it's, now the other issues that, you know, it's communication to, to the taxpayers as well. Uh, you, you know, you can deal with the uh, communication with the, about the, t the taxpayer rights. You can co deal with the, the tax practitioners because, yes, you're reading, you're dealing with them, but it, that's uh, only a sector of, a, uh, of the taxpayers. But what about the poor ones? What about the ones that are not able to, uh, to, 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 to address uh, or to understand the tax laws? Uh, you know, there are challenges now. How do we reach out to that? It takes money, it takes funding, it takes a whole lot of things. So uh, those kind of challenges, uh, they are there, they are, they, they are alive. And um, we, you, we can be using radio, print media, we can use television and the like. That's what we're doing. But 
the task is too much. You just need a lot of people uh, to get to know so that they can utilize the office. So if they do not have, do not know their rights, how will they ever exercise them? So that's, that's one of the big challenges. Now, yes, there are good things that have happened. And, and I must say, you know, when it comes to the revenue authority in South Africa, moving from having to wait for eight to 10 months or 12 months for an assessment, now at the click of the button, three seconds, six seconds, you get an assessment. The tax register increased from three million, under three million, uh, in, in 1994 to over 23 million. Now, you talk about uh, improvement, yes, but yet there are still a lot of issues to deal with. Um, so, I don't want to be thrown out. <laughs> I still want to, especially that, uh, you know, I just happened to sneak my wife in. Uh, um, yeah, only, uh, only a few, few of us noticed that. Uh, you know, next week we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, so. Uh, ah. So, uh, she sits right there at the back. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very happy to participate in this conference, and I would like to thank very much Nina Olson for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. So the topic of my presentation is tax amnesties and tax compliance, the case of Greece. So in the beginning of my presentation, I will speak about the features of tax amnesties in general, and then I will focus on Greece. In the last part of my presentation, I will try to describe how a tax amnesty can be best designed in Greece and elsewhere, while incorporating the taxpayer rights that are many times forgotten. So tax amnesties are actually a well-established, ancient, and widely used institution in the whole world. Comparative data <laughs> shows that most countries in Europe, Australia, elsewhere, and most states in the United States of America have resorted at some point in some sort of tax amnesty schemes. However, the oldest known tax amnesty dates back to, e uh, dates to Egypt, is found to Egypt around 200 BC. And this program's records remains one of the British Museum's most famous attraction by virtue of its inscription upon the Rosetta Stone. So the message written on the stone describes the records uh, and the terms of the first tax amnesty in the human history. In that case, the priest of Memphis Temple thanked the monarch for not demanding a large sum of tax arrears due by the people. Tax amnesties have frequently been justified as politically popular uh, uh, to generate and, uh, an increase in uh, government revenue, especially in times of revenue shortfall. However, as we are going to see today, the beneficial impact of tax amnesties on revenue generation remains, remains to be seen. In addition to that, these amnesties are unlikely to generate significant revenue when judged against the potential danger of reducing future tax compliance. In that sense, revenue generation and tax compliance appear to be difficult to reconcile when tax amnesties are adopted. In parallel, a justification often provided for, for offering a tax amnesty is that special circumstances may motivate unwanted breaches of the law or mistakes of the citizens. This is mainly true for amnesties that ac accompany big tax reforms. In these cases, tax amnesties are well-founded in terms of equity and should not be harmful in terms of efficiency since they should be unexpected and unlikely to be repeated. However, as we will see in the case of Greece, the resort to tax amnesties is much more frequent and more widespread than what one would expect on the basis of exceptional circumstances. Many of them were called final amnesties or last chance uh, one last chance amnesties, although many followed. 
lawmakers and tax administrations are constantly devising new types of tax amnesties and innovation and differentiation in this field is likely sparked by the great need to capture the attention of the public and to appeal and convince non-compliant taxpayers to come forward. The timing of amnesties is a key feature, feature in their functioning, how long the program is available and whether or not extensions will be granted. The frequency with which amnesties are offered clearly, aff clearly affects the results uh, as well. In some countries, unaudited taxpayers who spontaneously come forward and report tax evasion can be granted a standing permanent tax amnesty, although these amnesties are never extensive and are sometimes available only for, for a limited period of time. Standard tax amnesties instead can be designed to cover recent or past liabilities that still fall within the expiration term of the tax obligation. The benefits of amnesties for the participants can extend to the future as various provisions can be introduced to reduce future tax liabilities. Another important aspect of tax amnesties is the information disclosed by participants which serves to condition their future expected payments. Some amnesties provide for the free writing off of past liabilities so long as the latest tax return of the taxpayer was honest. When a tax return is filed, ordinarily the tax administration maintains its full powers of auditing. Taxpayers participating in an amnesty may also be subject to special surveillance in subsequent years. Of course, all these features reduce the potential appeal of a tax amnesty. If the government is primarily interested in raising revenue and encouraging participation to boost the immediate amnesty proceeds, then the auditing powers can be limited or excluded and an anon anonymity can be offered to the participants. One way this is achieved is by allowing to participants to disclose their liabilities and to make the amnesty payments to a third par party, uh, most frequently a bank, which will release a certificate to be used in future tax audits by the taxpayer. In terms of the financial benefits provided to participants, some tax amnesties not only reduce or waive sanctions, but also reduce the capital on the tax. These are the so-called extensive tax amnesties, which offer often uh, grant immunity from audits for past and sometimes future tax liabilities. With regard to the coverage, one aspect is the type of tax or tax base to which the amnesty refers. From this aspect, in principle, all types of payments can be considered, including social contributions, for example. With reference to the tax base, it is important to distinguish between standard amnesties and amnesties specifically targeted to flight capital. The latter usually involves also problems of international relations and tax competition. We will see that specifically for Greece. In terms of the extent of coverage, amnesties are offered granted only to taxpayers not yet under investigation. For example, those who missed the deadline or failed to file one or, or more tax returns or did report regularly but cheated. Amnesties can also include those whose liability has already been assessed or liquidated, the so-called accounts receivable. Last but not least, amnesties can involve leverage. In some cases, taxpayers are required to invest the hidden tax base in special public de debt bonds or in the taxpayer's country for a spe specified time period. By granting an amnesty, the tax administration surrenders the right to collect payments from taxpayers through standards means, such as audit or litigation in courts. You see in the end of my slides the term voluntary disclosure programs. Well, this is tax amnesties, but it's a more politically correct term, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the design of an efficient tax amnesty is closely linked with the study of the behavior, behavior of the taxpayer. Many factors influence his behavior, economic, social, psychological, personal, and so on. So taking into account all these factors, the taxpayers decide to comply or evade from tax. Theory suggests that tax evasion, tax compliance, and tax collection are economic problems for governments because the taxpayers, uh, who are individual economic actors, although having voted collectively for a given level of public goods, will not be generally uh, uh, happy to voluntarily finance such a level. The reason for this is clear. The social benefit derived from the marginal expenditure on public goods is greater than anyone's individual private benefit. Therefore, at a societal optimum, the individual will not be at a private optimum unless an additional constraint, in, constraint is added, which is that the socially determined level of taxes be paid. The greater the divergence between the perceived individual benefits from public expenditure and the private cost, the greater is the incentive to evade and avoid taxes. Having said that, 
convincing a non-compliant taxpayer to come forward vol voluntarily has to do with making an appealing offer to him with regard to the benefits of the amnesty for him. In this sense, we could say that the state treats him like a customer who goes out for shopping in a period of sales. The amnesty is the product which has to be sexy to be bought. Uh, there is a kind of specific tax market in which only the tax non-compliant taxpayers may participate and shop. The problem is that in their case, even, they should, even if they should be punished, instead they are uh, treated in a, in a favorable way. They are rewarded in a way. In some cases, we could even say uh, that because of the fact that they pay their taxes later and, and without or less fines, the state even gives them a loan and this loan is financed, unfortunately, by the taxes of others. So the marketing, as you understand, is a crucial factor for the success of the amnesty. I found that uh, during my research that uh, the Michigan tax amnesty in 2002 has a had a quite good uh, slogan, which was, get to us before we get to you. I think that this was quite successful in the sense that it was a comprehensive message combining not only the good part, which was the benefit, but also reminding the taxpayer of the possibility to be audited and punished if he does not come forward voluntarily. So coming to the topic of tax amnesty and trust, I would like to say that uh, most countries, most tax administrations, when they are uh, designing a tax amnesty, they primarily or even they only uh, focus on non-compliant taxpayers, which is their target group. So they want to make them compliant by offering the motivation to comply and come forward because they want the revenue generation and the tax compliance of them. However, there is another group, and these are the constantly compliant taxpayers. And when a tax amnesty is offered to the non-compliant ones, this induces, or might induce, the loss of trust in the tax morale of the compliant taxpayers, which risks to reduce the future compliance of this group, and of course, this, cre uh, this risks to erode the tax base in general. So, coming to my country now, and to put you in perspective, the yearly loss of tax revenues uh, from tax evasion is more than 7 billion euros. Uh, and if forgiveness is not an occasional act, but a constant attitude, as Martin Luther King suggested, <laughs> then it clearly seems that the Greek tax administration has mastered this mantra <laughs> under the banner of tax amnesty programs, which have been adopted repeatedly again and again in different forms since the beginning of the 80s and until today. So we have two general categories of tax amnesties. The first has to do with the tax amnesties for capital repatriation. And the second one, which we will see just afterwards, has to do with uh, general tax amnesties that are offered every time for a limited time period. So for the tax amnesties for capital repatriation, the inspiration was the very successful Italian tax amnesty. The reason for that was that in 2001, Italy had imposed an amnesty uh, which uh, uh, provided for a flat tax of 5% on the undeclared funds. In total, Italy has succeeded in bringing back uh, 80 billion euros, which was almost 6% of the country's GDP. So Greece made two efforts. The first one was in 2004 by law 3259. Uh, this amnesty lasted from August 2004 until July 2005. It was not initially this, but it has been extended, so the end of it was July 2005. So the amnesty provided for a very generous flat tax of 3% on the capital already abroad when the law entered into force, and this should be repatriated through financial institutions in Greece. Both individuals and companies were eligible. Uh, the tax administration was not interested at all on how and where the assets have, made, have been acquired, and the tax obligation was exhausted with the payment of this flat tax, which means that if the taxpayer had to pay also income tax, this was waived. The second tax amnesty was uh, granted in 2010 by law 38 42, and uh, 
This uh, um, lasted from uh, April 2010 until the end of September 2011, also because it was extended in between. So in that case, we had two separate taxes, uh, one a flat tax of 5% if the capital was repatriated and invested in Greece for two years, or an 8% flat tax if the capital was just de declared to the tax authorities and tax was paid, but it could just stay abroad. Uh, the problem was that uh, the law that had been adopted in between in 2008 on money laundering uh, had remained applicable, so there was no criminal amnesty given as well. For both amnesties, there has been uh, an endless wave of, of circulars that were issued in order to inform, uh, to inform the taxpayers on how to do it because it was the first time that such, such a thing was offered in Greece. Uh, so, um, Although uh, the tax amnesties almost universally conclude with celebratory headline grabbing recovery levels, these gross recovery levels are probably unrepresentative of what the amnesty truly recovered. So let's see what happened in Greece. Well, the, ambitious, the, ambitio the goals were ambitious in both cases. However, the results were at least disappointing. In the 2004 tax amnesty, the goal announced by the ministry was uh, between five and 10 billion euros the capital re repatriated at the end was just uh, 1.5 billion euros and the tax revenue resulted in 50 million euros. In 2010, uh, the goal announced was even bigger, 20 billion. Uh, the capital repatriated was uh, 425 million euros and the collected tax revenues almost 25 million euros. So it's a little bit, yes. Too much for nothing, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I told you before that we had a lot of last chances to comply in Greece, or one, only one uh, uh, last chance. Well, it was not only one, we had 11 of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to go through all of them. The first one, of course. <laughs> Uh, the general idea that was that this, uh, the type of amnesty was a kind of tax settlement, so it referred to unaudited tax years. Uh, you see in every case the years concerned in each case. And uh, the taxpayer had to uh, go to the authorities and pay some amount of tax, and this would result in closing these accounting years for him or his enterprise and not being controlled afterwards. So I will refer a little bit in the 2010 uh, amnesty just to give you an idea. So it uh, uh, comprised an audited accounting periods, overdue debts, and also dis disputed cases. Okay. Uh, so in 2015, in June, there was another tax amnesty which was announced that it would be adopted. So a new draft law on global tax amnesty to repatriated overseas funds to Greece has been put into public consultation. It has never been submitted to the parliament. The reason was, uh, first, uh, the general negative reaction of the public because the criminal penal penalties would be waived. That was a big difference. Mm -hmm. The second reason was that during the negotiations with the institutions, the institutions said no. Mm -hmm. The reason for that was at least this was what was reported. Uh, the reason for that was that uh, this amnesty would comprise, uh, would provide for a 15% uh, flat rate on the declared offshore funds, while normally for these amounts, the tax rate is now around 45%. So you see what would be the result. So, uh, however, voluntary, voluntary disclosure programs <laughs> are, it should be part of the tax compliance strategy of the state of the states, they, however, strike they must, however, strike a balance between providing sufficient incentives for those engaged in non-compliance to come forward and not rewarding or encouraging such behavior. So here we see the compliance pyramid uh, with regard to the voluntary disclosure that the OECD has published in 2015 in its publication offshore voluntary disclosure programs. So uh, the challenge is to keep the voluntary disclosure programs in between the compliant taxpayers and the non-compliant taxpayers and keep the compliant taxpayers compliant while only the non-compliant ones go down and comply. So 
this balance was not found in the brick case, in the brick cases. And in order to see how we could design a good tax amnesty if we have to have one, I think that the decision tree of the OECD for starting a voluntary disclosure initiative or, or program is very, very useful. So the state should take uh, decisions about uh, establish the reason, determine the scope, establish the, the terms, the reporting requirements, then consider the opportunity for the intelligence gathering, and then build a communication strategy. Uh, the features of a successful tax amnesty program, it should be clear about its aims and terms. It should deliver demonstrable and cost-effective increase in tax revenues, be consistent with the generally applicable compliance and enforcement regimes, help to deter non-compliance, improve levels of compliance of among the population eligible for the program, and complement the immediate yield for disclosures with measures that improve compliance in the long term. How to integrate the taxpayer rights into tax amnesty programs? First of all, observe fairness and equity principles. Care about the non-compliant taxpayers who are the target of the program. However, at the same time, take care about the law-abiding taxpayers. Uh, uh, make sure that there is transparency and diffusion of information about voluntary disclosure programs with guidance packs, information packs, etc. Mm -hmm. And make sure that there is conf confidentiality and uh, make sure about how the information is disclosed or not and where and how. Uh, I will not refer to the OECD standard on exchange of financial account information for tax purposes. However, I think that after its uh, entry into force, it will help a lot on uh, designing, on exchange of uh, information about uh, people that have uh, funds abroad while respecting all these rights. And in order to conclude my presentation, <laughs> seeing the anatomy of tax amnesties and tax compliance structures together is like a magi bad magical image. Depending on what is the primary objective of the tax uh, amnesty, the tax revenue or the tax compliance, the image changes. So combining both tax compliance and tax revenue collection uh, uh, without risking none is almost impossible. But at the same time, this is a constant challenge for the tax administrations across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have been given special dispensation from Nina. Um, we start a bit late, and we don't think we should be penalized. So we have a few minutes to do some questions. So if anybody has any questions for any of our panelists, please head to either microphone or somebody can bring. Do we have a portable mic? Okay, we will bring a mic to you in a moment. One moment. No, we, 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 it's coming. It's coming. Not a problem. They can't hear it in the booth. I have an observation and I have a question. The observation is that the only positive aspect of FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, is that it has all of the foreign financial institutions performing Article I of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. All foreign financial institutions by FATCA are required to go through their entire client list looking for clients born in the United States and in so doing, contact those clients and inform them that they are U.S. citizens and therefore they have obligations to the United States government. So the irony is you've got your foreign banks in the, in the entire world performing the Bill of Rights article of informing people that they're American citizens. This has led to a new word in the tax lexicon, the accidental American. <laughs> and it is a very serious consideration now, both by the U.S. Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service. Amanda, thank you for acknowledging that the U.S. Bill of Rights, Taxpayer Bill of Rights, is not currently enforceable. Which leads me to the question for you and or Nina, and that is the fact we learned today the possibility of legislation coming out of the House Ways and Means Committee and the U.S. Senate concerning a U.S. Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And I would like if you would if you pursue that just a little bit. I mean, what are the chances? Uh, do, do we think it will really pass? Will it become then legislation, which will give it the teeth that will allow us to make it uh, a matter of, of action? Thank you. Nina, you, okay. Um, oh, 
I'll be done with this. Just water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be done with that. Um, you know, I, I, no, no, man, I, I never candy ha handicap Congress, and Amanda would certainly never handicap Congress. Um, and uh, until a bill is marked up and it's made public, you have no idea what's going to be in it. And the only thing that the sponsors of the bill have let me say is that there is a is a taxpayer bill of rights, you know, piece coming in. I want to. I, I would personally want to clarify the point of, you know, is the bill of rights enforceable? And I think what we've been trying to say is that in and of itself is a piece of paper, unlike the human conventions or unlike, you know, the human rights conventions or unlike our US Constitution, which is the Constitution from which all laws derive their legitimacy, the Bill of Rights doesn't have that. But as Manda was trying to say, under the specific statutory provisions, there are significant protections that give teeth to the individual bills, you know, the rights that are listed on that piece of paper. But as we found in our crosswalk, there were several provisions in the Bill of Rights that didn't have a lot of teeth. There were not a lot of remedies. And that's led us to start trying to propose some legislation that would fill some of those gaps. And some, and this, this piece of legislation, if it ever sees the light of day, as I've been told it will, contains some of those very provisions to fill those gaps. Thank you, Nina. Um, other questions or comments? While you are pondering, let me ask one question. Um, same question for all three panelists. Um, brief and insightful answers. Okay. So, We've talked about progress to date in each country um, and a lot of challenges. So what is the single biggest challenge, single biggest challenge moving forward in the US, South Africa, and Greece in operationalizing taxpayer rights? The single biggest challenge moving forward in operationalizing taxpayer rights. I'll, I'll start first, and, and this is based on, on my own experience. You know, Nina might have a, a different answer, but in all of our efforts to try to operationalize taxpayer rights and incorporate taxpayer rights information, uh, there's been quite a reluctance on the part of the IRS, and they come back and say, our current procedures are adequate. We follow the law. And they technically follow the law, but they don't really meet the spirit of the law. And so I, I think that's our challenge going forward is um, convincing the IRS to, um, to go further than just the absolute bare minimum and actually facilitating taxpayers and exercising those rights so, they, so that they're real and they're not just you know, a piece of paper. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, I, I think it's almost the same in, in, in South Africa in the sense that uh, uh, not being used to be uh, um, looked at or examined or you know, it can be a challenge. You know, now you suddenly have to to make sure that you act in a, s a specific way. And, and I think the biggest challenge is just communication. Everything must filter down to even the lowest employee, uh, you know, in terms of taxpayer rights. Uh, it must be made clear. Um, yes. Thank you. Tonya. So I think that it has to do uh, with the simplification and transparency of procedures and uh, in which uh, the taxpayer should regain trust in the tax administration and become a partner of it. Because so far we have seen lengthy procedures that end nowhere, so I think this is the most important thing. Thank you. The day is turning to night. It's getting late. You're still here, the faithful. Um, I would just like to thank our panelists for providing very practical insights on operationalizing taxpayer rights. Specifically, some of the themes that were common is how to increase taxpayer awareness of these rights so that taxpayers are truly informed and responsible citizens. And you also shed a lot of light on how to increase tax authority staff capacity, especially line officers those officials who actually interact 
with the taxpayers so that tax officials are truly public servants. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panelists.